food and anxiety disorder. So what we often refer to as PMADS, um, which is an umbrella uh, term um, that covers all of the different kinds of mood and anxiety disorders that women might experience, including depression, anxiety, OCD, um, et cetera. We have um, three different levels of uh, care or services. We have first would be our support groups. So we have a variety of support groups covering a variety of different topics. Um, one of our newest support groups is a group for mothers of color that I run on Mondays from four to five. Um, our other sort of tier of service is our traditional outpatient service um, that um, offers treatment in reproductive psychiatry and psychotherapy. Our third tier, tier of treatment is our day program, which is a more intensive um, treatment that's offered to moms, um, pregnant and postpartum moms who are really struggling to take care of themselves and or their baby. Um, a few logistical things before I introduce our amazing panel just to um, highlight that this webinar is being recorded and will be available to all participants um, after our discussion tonight. Um, along over the course um, of our discussion, if any questions um, sort of come up for you, I encourage you to throw them in the chat and we'll have time dedicated at the end to address those questions, whether it's to a specific um, member of our panel or just general questions. Um, so put them in the chat and we'll get to them towards uh, the end. Um, and I think that's all the logistical things. So um, without further ado, I would like to um, begin by introducing our um, amazing panel. And I'm going to start with, um, Dr. Camille Clare. Uh, Dr. Camille Clare is an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at New York Medical College. She is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist and attending physician and received her medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Dr. Clare was recently appointed as chair and professor at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at SUNY Downstate College of Medicine and School of Public Health, a role that she will take in January, 2021. We also have tonight, Dr. Veronica Johnson. Uh, Dr. Veronica Johnson has been working in the area of cultural competence, race and cultural sensitivity training for 10 years. After attaining her PhD in counseling psychology at Teachers College, Columbia University, she went on to become assistant professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Dr. Johnson has published numerous academic papers, including one article in the Journal of Black Psychology that investigates a strength-based approach to conducting psychotherapy with Black American adults. In addition, Dr. Johnson regularly publishes papers on race-based traumatic stress, racial identity development, and cultural competence therapeutic techniques. We also have Dr. Mariel Bouquet. Um, Dr. Mariel Bouquet is a Columbia University trained trauma-informed psychologist, disruptor, and sound bath meditation healer. Her work centers on healing wounds of intergenerational trauma for Black and Indigenous people of color, holistic mental wellness, and the decolonization of Eurocentric healing practices. She also focuses on consulting with organizations in the areas of mental wellness and anti-racism as she believes in the liberation of our minds and of oppressive systems as necessary qualities of overall wellness. And Dr. Sneha Ghazi. Uh, Dr. Sneha Ghazi is the owner of Sneha Physical Therapy and in-home and telehealth physical health practice. Uh, Dr. Ghazi graduated from Columbia University, University's doctorate in physical therapy and practices therapeutic manual therapies and evidence-based exercises to give back to the community. 
She began a nonprofit organization, Physical Therapy International Foundation, to bring physical therapy services globally to underserved populations. Um, and I realized that I did not introduce myself, so I will do that now. So I'm Dr. Roshni Vasquez. I'm a licensed psychologist uh, working at the Motherhood Center. Um, I work full time there and work primarily in the day program that I described earlier. I do a little bit of work in the outpatient, um, including the Mothers of Color support group um, that I run Mondays from four to five. And I'll remind everyone at the end, but anyone in attendance today um, that would like to attend the Mothers of Color support group will get 15% off um, after registering um, for today's webinar. So with that, um, why don't we just jump into our discussion? Um, I, I wanted to start off by just asking kind of like a general question um, to sort of get the discussion going. And I was wondering if each of you um, on the panel would be able to begin to share some thoughts um, from your own perspective and expertise and work that you do on the state of disparities, the obstacles that exist for Black and other women of color, um, specific to maternal and mental health care. So maybe we can just sort of start there and continue our, our dialogue. So anyone who wants to start? I can start if you like, I was on yeah. mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I thank you. Thank you to Shannon and Paige for the opportunity to uh, present uh, at, at this pa esteemed panel. I, I feel very humbled by my colleagues who I share this uh, stage with. Um, I would say in my work, um, I was a practicing obstetrician up until two weeks ago. I still intend to practice um, in East Harlem, Spanish Harlem. And so um, I took care of a lot of underserved, um, uninsured or underinsured uh, patients black and brown patients, primarily um, immigrant populations who were very often challenged in terms of getting mental health services, either because of um, lack of culturally competent uh, providers or feeling like there may not have been enough culturally competent providers who understood, and as well as structurally competent providers who understood and their unique lived experiences. I, I would like to say I'm a, a gynecologist in that I, you know, was offering um, a lot of services to my patients uh, within the realm of what I do for a living in terms of support um, as best as I could because um, we know that black and brown uh, women in particular are less likely to seek mental health services or seek them late or be unable to have appropriate follow-up as well as deal with the stigma of seeking care um, for mental health services in particular um, because of their own um, you know, challenges or cultural concerns or just, just the stigma of seeking care um, in this area. And very often I had to tell my patients that you know, we wouldn't ignore the diabetes, we wouldn't ignore your high blood pressure in the same way um, these mental health conditions are also equally important um, to seek care for. So from my perspective, um, this area is very, very important and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that to, to the audience. Um, I'd love to jump in to thank you so much um, for the Motherhood Center uh, for setting this up um, and equally honored and humbled to be here with a lot of friends and colleagues as well on the stage. Um, so when it I'm a physical therapist, so I, I see a lot of mothers uh, who come to me with physical complaints. Uh, and then as we move very closely through our plan of care, I work um, very intimately with my patients uh, it's usually not a one-stop shop. We have a couple of weeks or perhaps even sometimes a couple of months of care that go on um, for the mother to really overcome some of the challenge that, challenges that she's facing physically. And there will be a lot of uh, emotions that will come through that because as we know, mental health and physical health are so linked. They're really one and the same. Um, there's so many studies that show how uh, any, even just a history of, uh, of low back pain is linked with depression or anxiety, or uh, current ongoing pelvic girdle pain, um, or for this population specifically, something that I treat and we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in some of the talk is 
um, bowel, bladder, and sexual function. Huge taboo topics to speak about, not only in any culture, but sometimes even more specifically in traditional cultures and traditional black and brown cultures where you can't be as open to speak about certain things uh, and what's going on with your body. So I think this topic is incredibly important. There is definitely a disparity and I'm uh, very thankful that we have platforms like these to uh, more than anything, raise awareness on this because I think that's step one is just raise that awareness, educate, providers, educate patients, educate everybody in between, get everybody on the same page, and then move forward and create solutions. And I think this isn't really a great step. I'm wondering, Dr. Johnson, yeah, and Dr. Bouquet, sort of letting us know a little bit about in the mental health um, areas. So uh, I'll jump in. I'm a counseling psychologist by training. Um, and so, um, I have really focused on in my own private practice, which is in um, located in Harlem and also in my research experience as a professor at John Jay, have really focused on trying to understand those specific barriers that, um, that uh, BIPOC individuals and particularly women have when it comes to seeking mental health treatment. And so um, what I've understood is that there, you know, there are num numerous barriers, right? But some of those have to do with what happens right before you go in the therapy, you know, in the therapeutic space and what happens in that first initial encounter. And so I hope to, you know, tonight I'll have an opportunity to talk about some of the ways in which providers can do better with regard to making sure that um, BIPOC women feel comfortable when they do have the opportunity to reach out and talk about some of those barriers that happen before a person even seeks out treatment. Um, you know, things such as stigma around mental health, um, a reliance on sort of, you know, um, other forms of coping that can be good, but sometimes fall a bit short, such as, you know, spiritual and religious reliance, all are great, um, but sometimes don't feel quite enough. Um, and so I hope that we'll be able to get a little bit more into those topics this evening. Hi, hey everybody. Um, I'm equally honored to be among you all. And um, I'm really excited to be able to dive into this topic that is incredibly needed and I hope can be just the beginning of numerous conversations uh, around how we can support BIPOC mothers. Um, so I'm, a, I'm also a counseling psychologist by training and um, the work that I do really centers on holistic mental health. So it's um, really about capturing um, the, the fullness of not only um, what is happening within an individual's life, but also systemically what is upholding the barriers that aren't, you know, allowing a person that is BIPOC identified and a, and a mother at that um, to actually be able to access care and, and um, from a place where um, she feels grounded in and, and safe in the wellness that is the wellness practices that are being provided to her. Um, so, you know, a lot of the, the work that um, I've been fortunate to do and, and honored to do with um, BIPOC mothers, both in um, a hospital setting where I'm currently situated um, in, in my primary practice and then also my private practice has been um, with, unfortunately, you know, it has been more reactionary kind of care, right? And rather than preventative care and the care that BIPOC women deserve, you know, um, uh, in their journey towards something that is um, as vulnerable and as um, delicate as a, a mothering journey. And so I'm really hoping that we can, you know, talk about just the global landscape of how we can best support uh, BIPOC mothers in their journey and beyond uh, their journey in, in the perinatal uh, landscape, postnatal, and then beyond that, um, so that we can really uphold Black mothers in a way that hasn't been done in this nation and perhaps in the world before. Great, thank, thank you all of you. Um, so there are sort of a couple of general questions, you know, that I have, and then, you know, there are some specific things that, I, you know, that I'm hoping to ask each of you um, just so that we can all get sort of specific um, sort of knowledge and wisdom from each of you. And certainly, you know, I, I want to encourage our panel, you know, to not necessarily have to wait for me to ask for a question, but, you know, for us to really have a nice, rich dialogue, I think, um, you know, would, would, would be our goal. So, you know, I don't want to discourage folks from, um, 
uh, so I'm not jumping in. Um, but I'm wondering if we can also sort of move and talk a little bit about some of the conditions um, that may go untreated and, you know, sort of in thinking about things like pain, uh, pelvic floor issues, sort of larger quality of life issues. I'm wondering if we can sort of shift our conversation to talk about some of those um, specific topics um, that you all see in your own individual practices and, and areas? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to jump in on this one. This is, uh, it's just so um, actually sad that so much of pelvic floor dysfunction just goes untreated, undiagnosed. And this is really in the general population too. Um, I will, I've treated and continue to treat people of all different um, ethnicities and across the board, people will say that they feel like they're not really sure what's going on with their bodies and when uh, something is wrong medically. Um, and sometimes it's not even like the big things like uh, preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, like those things get screened out, but similar to mental health, some of those more taboo topics like in urinary and fecal incontinence, things like um, painful intercourse, things like pelvic organ prolapse uh, affect people's quality of life a lot. And, and so much so that they feel shame, uh, shameful about speaking to um, their friends or their family, let alone speaking to a healthcare professional um, or a healthcare professional that they don't identify with or that there's a language barrier with. Um, or a cultural barrier with that they don't know how to put those terms or uh, the things that they're feeling into um, real words that they can actually seek help. So I think that um, this particular topic around quality of life is very important because once people get into a stable place from their health, meaning their vitals are okay and you know they're discharged, they can go uh, home with their baby, they might be going through so many things physically and not be able to handle it also because they have a newborn and also because they're going through some amount of anxiety or some amount of depression um, and mental health through the process. So it, I think it's just that all these layers that um, affect a mother. And I think that uh, education and educating people on what are the different things that could go wrong and preventing them a, in the first place or knowing when to seek help when those kinds of things happen is really key. I was going to say that um, as we think about some of our Western traditional notions of what it means to be a mother and motherhood in society, I think um, the ability to cope with that or, or especially from a cultural perspective where that's thought of in, in many different ways, um, which may be different from, from the majority, I think that that can lead to difficulties with coping, um, especially in this world of the pandemic that we're dealing with now and several of the challenges six to eight months ago regarding the experience of the birthing process, having a visitor, not having a visitor, having a support person, not having a support person, um, the birthing experience not being what you thought it might have been. Many of those challenges can lead to mental health um, issues. Um, if you were predisposed to have that, maybe not appropriately screened at the time, we were not seeing patients as often in these last six to eight months. And so that having that ability to, to verbalize um, those concerns as Dr. Gaza mentioned to your healthcare provider, all those things can be a source of um, anxiety and stress for patients and learning how to cope with those stressors uh, in a way that's um, you know, appropriate to your own lived experiences, I think um, are additional challenges that um, we need to deal with. And as Dr. Gaza mentioned, some of those more sensitive issues, sexual issues, um, issues that are, that are not traditionally seen as, as um, quote unquote appropriate, which for me as an OBGYN, those are issues that I've developed a trust with my patients that they are comfortable in talking to me about those things that they may not be able to talk to other providers about. Um, and so just developing that relationship with your patients is so key so that they can able to make that connection, that mental and physical connection um, about those challenges that can affect either one um, are, is really important. So I just want to emphasize that as well. 
And I wanted to, you know, just trail off of um, what Dr. Ghazi mentioned in, in reference to education, right? Like proper education to society really at large, right? Like being able to impose like uh, education that is accessible at multiple levels within society so that um, the, the issues and the challenges that come up in uh, the perinatal and mothering process aren't coming up for the first time. Um, and, and that, you know, we have adequate information at, at our disposal. I, some of the, the conditions that Dr. Ghazi mentioned, um, I've heard uh, most recently people saying like, that's a thing that exists, like, are, wow. Like, you know, who would have known that, you know, um, a woman, you know, um, postnatally, or even, you know, later on in life, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and so on, right, might actually develop complications that, that look like this, like that this is actually a way that our bodies, you know, um, begin to transform naturally or unnaturally. And, and the fact that that isn't, you know, something that um, we could be privy to. So that also from the mental health end, right, there is less of the shame and the anguish and the distress that, that a person starts experiencing as a result of uh, coming into this knowledge, um, especially during very, uh, uh, vulnerable times, right, and critical times, uh, such as um, the the perinatal season. Um, you know, there there are other conditions that are more kind of on the mental health end that that are having more of a limelight in society. However, you know, not so much in many ways. Like, you know, we we understand that there is like perinatal like anxiety based conditions and depression. However, like some of the other areas that uh, are likely to be experienced, even postnatally, right? Um, you know, postpartum depression. We talk probably a little bit less about um, postpartum psychosis or depression that has psychotic features, right? Like some of the, the ways in which um, a person's mental health can actually reach a certain level um, that uh, where people really are attuned to what's happening or have an understanding of, you know, what's happening enough to help the person, right? And as I mentioned, in terms of, you know, the, the reactionary uh, process of health uh, towards BIPOC mothers, we tend to, you know, see individuals sometimes kind of even later on in the process. And um, it, it, it could be really important to actually loop in all of the individuals that are part of the journey with the mother and the mother herself in order to, to actually provide the, the proper education that can actually um, help to uh, supersede some of these conditions or actually help in the journey to, uh, around these conditions rather than you know, relegate them and keep them in a, in a place of being too taboo to talk about. I actually want to, um something that Dr. Claire said, you know, that, that I wanted, um, that I was hoping um, you all would be able to speak to a little bit was, you know, this idea of, <clears throat> um, you know, how to address or, you know, what, what, your, what your thoughts are about um, trust, because, you know, often something that comes up in the work that I do is this idea of, um, trust in the provider, right? And so whether that's wanting a provider that looks like me, whether that's um, making sure that the provider sort of gets me or, you know, can I trust them um, comes up and, you know, I would imagine it comes up in, in all of your work. And I was, um, you know, I'm so, sort of curious uh, thoughts on that, on that topic. I can speak, you know, from the position of a psychologist, I, you know, most of the uh, clients that I work with in my private practice are uh, black women. Um, and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I think that um, for black women, um, by virtue of also being a black woman, I think I represent um, a level of understanding and acceptance. Um, 
to other Black women that may or may not actually exist, by the way. Um, but I do recognize that, you know, research has told us this. I understand this, right? That seeing a provider um, that also shares some of your identity um, can really trigger feelings of safety um, and comfort and understanding. Um, it takes a bit more work to keep the person in the room once you've actually met them. But I, I do think that that goes a long way in terms of, you know, having providers available that are diverse, that can represent that safety and that comfort for patients. Um, on the other hand, I do find that that is, is sort of meaningless once you get into the work in that um, it's important for all providers, no matter their identity, to make sure that they are really, really um, not taking for granted how much they understand about a patient's experience. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, black women that I work with uh, will sort of assume that I, that I know what they're talking about all the times. So and one of the things I like to, you know, sort of um, work with them on is, is differentiating between myself and themselves, right? So yes, by virtue of being a black woman, there are ways in which I navigate the world uh, similarly to them um, because of our shared identity, but there are other ways in which I don't understand their experience and I don't wanna take for granted or miss things because I haven't asked about their sort of, um, their sort of relationship to their identity, um, which could be very different from my own. So um, a lot of times, you know, I. Black women who come and work with me will say, I've been waiting two years for a Black female therapist to become available. And that really scares me, actually. Um, and it has sort of kind of, uh, you know, spurred my work, my research in this area, because um, speaking specifically for psychology, it's 96% white at this point, right? And so it's much more likely that a white provider will be av available when someone needs services. Um, and while I recognize the importance of having more diversity in the field, and I recognize um, the safety and the comfort that can come with that, I also don't want anyone waiting two years um, to get services um, and to be treated, especially when they're in crisis. And so part of my work is really training all providers, no matter what you look like, to seek the understanding and to come from a cultural, culturally competent perspective where you're really looking for and honoring the cultural experiences and the values that are important for every patient um, to integrate that into the relationship. I think Dr. Um, Dr. Claire alluded to this, um, you know, the idea is that you are really taking time to build a relationship with a person and that includes getting to know them fully um, and all of their experiences. And I think that can go a really, really long way in terms of keeping someone engaged in treatment, right? Lowering the level of stigma that they walk into the room about, you know, providing some of the psychoeducation that we've been talking about and educating you sort of um, physical health education that we've been talking about as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, to, piggy, to piggyback on that, if, if I might, I, I think <laughs> that, um, that, that BIPOC individuals are a very a heterogeneous group and, and they're not homogeneous. And so that uh, the heterogeneity um, is, is important. So similarly, th there are only 4% of black physicians in the United States as well. And so it, it, it's not possible for us to take care of all the patients. And I'm also challenged when I hear um, people seeking a black OBGYN in particular, which surprisingly in New York is difficult to find for, for many individuals. And so I think um, it behooves all of us in, and I also educate residents and medical students so that, uh, so that everyone can have that structural and cultural competence to take care of BIPOC uh, patients um, in a way that's appropriate to their own lived experiences and hearing um, their perspectives because that influences um, who they are and the care that they receive specifically in the mental health space in particular. And so that's that's super, super critical um, to be able to have that trusting relationship with especially um, issues of health and um, uh, physical and mental health, which makes people already vulnerable, um, a, a vulnerable time in their life. And especially the time of uh, pregnancy and uh, the birthing experience, uh, an additional level of vulnerability because of the intimacy of the of the situation and the issues um, that patients are seeking, and so I think this is an ex excellent step to be able to continue those conversations, um, so that again we all can be better and better to deal with the disparities and the the poor outcomes, unfortunately, for uh, Black and Indigenous uh, mothers um, in this country.
Yeah, the, the topic of, you know, being able to um, infuse cultural fluency in the work is really, really important because, you know, to your point, Roshni, um, trust is, is integral in, in being able to um, feel like you're in good hands, right? And, and when we look at the disproportionate numbers of, of Black mothers that are impacted and, and BIPOC mothers that are impacted um, by um, lack of quality in maternal uh, health care, including mental health, um, you know, it, it, and, and that those numbers are becoming more and more public, right? As, as the world becomes more publicized, those numbers become more publicized. The, um, the experience of lack of trust becomes more prominent. And let's not lose sight of the fact that there is historical trust because of the exploitation of Black bodies and, and in Indigenous bodies, right? And so we have, you know, with us a, a whole entire history that comes in when that person comes into the room and, and seeks the service um, and, and that, you know, it is up to us as clinicians, up to us as individuals within systems, um, you know, to also um, look at the systems and the ways in which they uh, fall short of, of being able to provide the quality care that BIPOC mothers are deserving of and, and being able to, you know, extract the practices and the policies and, and the, um, the interactions that um, are, upholding these inequities and, and, and upholding this lack of trust that um, BIPOC communities continue to have with um, the health field, right? So that we can have um, a, a more sound relationship that is um, grounded and rooted in, in you know, um, best practices and, and can really help uh, to dissolve that infraction that has existed for so many years and so many, you know, um, such a multitude of, of, of decades, maybe centuries. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's up to all of us, you know, to, to actually do that work on behalf of the communities that we uh, seek to support and care for. Um, and, you know, we are heterogeneous, absolutely. And, and there are some things that also tie us as far as, you know, our histories within these systems and, um, and the ways in which we have collective mistrust um, upon the systems that continuously fail us. I'm wondering just to sort of <clears throat> um, uh, a, a little bit of a, a, a tangent to what we're just talking about, but you know, I um, you know thinking about what Dr. Johnson and, and Dr. Claire have highlighted, you know, sort of um, it, it, it's not going to be realistic, right? That our um, BIPOC moms will have a provider that looks like them, and so you know, and again, I'm sort of thinking of things that I often hear, which you know, can be something like I'm going to my doctor, right? Doctor could be, you know, OB, it could be this, it could be that. Um, and I don't feel heard. I don't feel um, that, that they are listening to me. And I'm sort of, you know, and, and I'm often in this position to kind of help support, right? Support moms, how to sort of navigate these difficult conversations, how to advocate for themselves, right? How to, um, remain empowered um, in these moments where they're quite vulnerable right? and, and having these interactions um, with doctors. And so I'm sort of wondering thoughts around um, sort of how to, um, how to support women in really advocating themselves in those, in those moments and sort of opening this up to, to, to all of you. I think I think specifically, although not directly related to mental mental health care, specifically in the areas of obstetrics, mm -hmm. um, we've seen the role of doulas and other community health workers be able to be that advocate for our, our patients in circumstances where um, they may not be able to advocate for themselves. And as, as we're learning to be better in, in addressing this, especially um, from the well-publicized view of um, maternal mortality and infant mortality and hearing the voices of patients that have, have well, you know, versed in many ways the fact that they are disrespected and not, not respected in the healthcare space. Um, that is one strategy that's been used um, in particular. Um, in the mental health space, I don't know that as well, but, but I would say, um, it, you know, as healthcare providers and clinicians, 
um, being able to um, really be better at that, hearing the voices of, of patients and knowing their own bodies and, and accepting that um, ha has been a challenge for, uh, I would say, collective us, right? I'm a part of that um, structurally racist system of medicine in which I practice. Um, and so, um, so that's very humbling. Um, uh, although we do know that, uh, that, that black and brown physicians in particular and providers, um, you know, it's been publicized that are more likely to communicate better with their patients, take better notes, have more extensive um, improved communication, which ultimately uh, leads to better outcomes, better health outcomes. And so there, there, is, um, there is still a role for advocating for uh, culturally uh, diverse um, and racially and ethnically diverse workforce, which is, which is so important, especially in the areas of physical and mental health, I think. I'm gonna jump in in a sort of slightly different perspective to jump off of uh, what Dr. Claire just said, but there is a lot of uh, research that shows how when a patient comes through the door, depending on how they uh, look and depending on how they sound, um, you're gonna put them in that box, right? And so their complaints might be identical to another patient who might just be different or in a different way, eloquent or speak in a certain way. And you might uh, downplay someone's symptoms who you don't affiliate with. And then somebody who you do look like, or somebody who does kind of speak more of your language, I put that on air quotes, you might feel like, oh, I'm going to validate their symptoms a little bit more. I'm going to give them a little bit more time. I'm going to give them that extra two minutes to hear what they have to say. And I think as a provider, that's where we can all do better. Um, and we can look at patients and read their symptoms and listen to their symptoms and be empathetic and take that history for what it is and not kind of dilute what that person is saying. If they're over-exaggerating or saying something that maybe you don't understand, still to take a step back and, um, and really analyze how you are reacting to different people's subjectives and different people's um, pain points and treating them for that alone. And I think that that begins to um, create a little bit more equity and uh, from a provider perspective specifically towards patient care. I know that's not answering from the patient side of things, but I think that's something that all providers can um, work on and, and do better with every day with their uh, daily care. Yeah. Wondering Dr. Johnson or Dr. Bouquet, if you have any thoughts on sort of Yeah, I can I can hop in here. I mean, this yeah. is something that's you know been on my mind for years, um, specifically in um, in psychology and and counseling and clinical psychology. Is this you know? And I think Dr. Ghazi is like it's a parallel thing that's happening right across psychology and physical health. But um, in psychology, we know that uh, BIPOC people, um, including women, um, are often sort of underdiagnosed with mood disorders and overdiagnosed with, um, you know, psychosis and other, you know, other sort of conditions that um, hold a lot more stigma, right? I think all mental disorders hold some degree of stigma, but what we find is that for BIPOC people, um, we tend to sort of, I mean, really underestimate people's pain, emotional pain. And so um, when a, you know, a BIPOC person goes to a physician or also to, or also to a mental health professional and talks about their level of anxiety, their level of depression, we tend to underestimate that. Um, and I think there are, you know, very clear historical ways that people's pain, emotional pain and physical pain have been undermined or, had, you know, we promoted this idea um, in medicine to Dr. Claire's point that, you know, like BIPOC women don't feel as much pain right, as other people. And so this, this, it's a pervasive problem. And, um, you know, my suggestion to, I mean, there's so much we can do on the side of providers, right? To Dr. Kazi's point, like we are working on that. I think from um, the patient's perspective though, doing some quick jotting down of notes of symptoms that you've noticed before a doctor's appointment can be really helpful. So that, you know, even in the moment where you feel like you might be feeling dismissed or feeling like, you know, anxious for some reason or another, you have a list of symptoms that you're like, I want to go through with you the symptoms that I've been experiencing, how often I've been experiencing them. Um, I think it's also really helpful to say, can you give me a referral? Because I want to 
see someone or want to talk to someone about my symptoms. We know for, um, we also know that BIPOC people, their main entry point into mental health treatment is a referral from a physician. That is like 90 something percent of the entry point uh, to mental health treatment for uh, BIPOC individuals. So um, creating a list of symptoms, um, you know, having an advocate, like a family member or a friend, especially through telemedicine to join appointments with you and sort of speak up about your symptoms um, when you are not feeling the most comfortable to do so. I mean, those are the sort of strategies that I think of off the top of my head, but you know, I think there's a, a number of different ways that especially mood symptoms really get under underdiagnosed. Yeah, in terms of advocacy, I mean, this may be, you know, kind of like more on the, um, presume radical end, right, you know, but um, uh, one of the ways in which BIPOC individuals can feel empowered, right, to, to understand really kind of what's happening around them is by also um, having heightened cultural consciousness and, and an understanding of um, who they are, you know, and how they're socially positioned um, and, and the stereotypes that, that kind of, uh, that stem from um, the, the white gaze, right? And so um, an understanding of that can also be something that, you know, um, it can be helpful in, in understanding what's happening in the room, what's happening in this space with me and, and um, you know, um, why is it that I am likely experiencing some level of discomfort? Because it can be really debilitating to be in a, in a space where you're having these emotional experiences um, around, let's say, having been microaggressed within an interaction with a practitioner. However, not really knowing, you know, the language or the 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 fact that you have been microaggressed or the fact that you have been relegated to a stereotype and not really understanding kind of what's happening around you, but knowing in, in your soul that something doesn't feel right, right? Um, so being able to you know, have that experience of heightened consciousness is something that is a protective factor and, and can be helpful um, for um, individuals. And also, you know, I think that there is this experience of placing individuals that hold these titles, like our titles, right? You know, doctor, mm -hmm. doctor such um, at uh, an esteem level, it's been, you know, just the way that society has um, motivated us to, to interact with individuals that have specific roles in society. Um, however, there is, you know, um, it just being able to empower the BIPOC individual, the BIPOC mother you know, to know that um, they, they have power and being able, interviewing power even, right? And being able to understand like, um, or ask the questions of their practitioner um, to, to understand if they have a, a, a good hold on uh, understanding their own experience and the ways in which um, they need to be cared for that can be uh, more specific um, in order to be more holistic for um, the, the BIPOC individual. Um, so, I, I mean, it's a, it's a tough thing to say, even because um, I understand that systemically, you know, um, we... Clients and also BIPOC individuals aren't necessarily the ones that are relegated to a position of power, right? Like that the privilege isn't necessarily always there. And that, you know, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, like sometimes um, the referrals come from a place of, you know, um, dire need or from a primary care physician. And there is this experience of, you know, this is perhaps the only clinician that can see me, or I finally found the black clinician that I was looking for, right? And so there is a level of vulnerability that the person has, which probably makes it so much more so that the person would be likely to want to engage in, um, in, in the position of interviewing the, their clinician, because it, you know, it, it, it can create a specific kind of interpersonal dynamic. However, it's really important because this is a person that is going to be in charge of your care, right? For you to understand what their perspective is, how they can under, whether or not they understand you globally um, as a human being, and if they integrate cultural fluency into the work that they're going to start doing with you. Thank you. I think I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I was going to add that that cultural humility piece on the point of us as providers is so critical and what we try to uh, train our students and residents about so that that 
not feeling threatened when patients uh, quote unquote interview us, as you mentioned, because I think that it's so important to have that second and third opinion, fourth opinion about, uh, about your care, if something that your provider is saying that doesn't make sense to you, that doesn't resonate you from your own lived experiences is critical. And um, I know, you know, there's been times when I'm like, hmm, why would they do that? But, but, but understanding more now, I would say, yes, that is a hundred percent appropriate that they should be able to seek someone that really understands their, their cultural, structural lived experiences is, is key, critical. So there's, there's a number, um, I know I said we were going to leave um, uh, questions in the chat for the end, um, but um, there seems to be a lot of sort of curiosity or wanting to understand about the role of um, medication. Um, Yeah, so many women who become pregnant believe that they must go off their medication immediately uh, because being on an antidepressant or some other medication um, is bad for the development of the fetus or uh, for breastfeeding. And certainly at the motherhood center, we get this all, all the time, in particular in our day program where um, moms are coming in in such distress and that's often a part of the recommendation, either something to address mood or to address sleep. Um, and there's so much concern or reporting that, you know, so-and-so told them that they needed to get off of a medication. And, and so, um, um, you know, so I'm, I'm sort of wondering if we could sort of op open it up to talk a, a little bit about that. And, you know, I, I, in my experience, I think in particular for BIPOC women, there's, there can be that, you know, it's already a stigma to sort of come in the door just for therapy. So the idea of then sort of incorporating medication is even more, you know, sort of like out there. So I'm just, you know, sort of wondering from your different perspectives, thoughts on education that's being given to pregnant women about medication or in the postpartum period, um, just wondering any thoughts. I could start. Um, I, I I would say that uh, since that it's over 50% of pregnancies, unfortunately, are unplanned. Uh, sometimes those conversations um, to have with uh, with uh, obstetrical providers is difficult to have before you become pregnant. Ideally, in the ideal world, that would be great to to have that conversation ahead of time. Um, unfortunately, some information is also lacking on the mental health and behavioral health provider as well in taking people off medications. We know that untreated depression and anxiety can lead to worsened outcomes for, for people. Um, and so um, having that shared decision-making regarding medications for the period of pregnancy or for breastfeeding, you know, that, that information is easily available to you, but having that shared decision-making with other people who, who may know a little bit more about what medications are safe in pregnancy, what medications are safe for breastfeeding individuals um, is really important as opposed to making decisions such as removing medications where people can decompensate and actually do worse um, because they're untreated and, and that can lead to um, poor outcomes for their children as well. Um, so I would start by saying that. Yeah, thank you. I will say, you know, um, just to, it, being a person that isn't a prescriber, right, um, and works with prescribers, um, I, I think it, it would be ideal, right, if individuals that are in multidisciplinary teams that don't hold that prescriber lens can also have that understanding, right? So that we can provide some of the education or reinforce some of the education that, you know, the prescriber is providing. Um, because there is, you know, um, that information that those myths, um, they permeate not only, you know, through um, the, the, the minds of the clients, but also the clinicians that do not hold that lens. And so, um, you know, I think that there's like, 
so much work that needs to be done in terms of what we need to know globally in in the full health arena around um, medication um, and and the impact and what kinds of medications and you know um, you know I mean there's so many variables right and of course that's not my area of expertise but however to have some sort of information that can be you know helpful uh, to to provide forward to the to the clients would be um, really key. I, I guess, you know, until this very panel, until until this very moment, until Dr. Claire spoke, I hadn't really kind of considered that or thought about it, um, you know, it, with such intent, right? But it is an important piece. And, and to follow up, someone just had directed a question to me in the chat regarding um, psychosis and treatment of psychosis and planning a pregnancy. Um, again, I would say the similar, very similar approach Ideally, having those conversations in a multidisciplinary way would be the best, right? I'm going to go to my OBGYN or my obstetrical provider to say, oh, I think in the next three to six months, I want to become pregnant. Uh, the, the, the idea is actually we're trying to talk to everyone, all kinds of providers, that those are conversations they should be having with the patients, even if the patients don't bring it up. Do you intend to become pregnant in the next three to six months, or when, what is your, it's called pregnancy intention. In the next year, do you plan? So if you are on medications for whatever mental health condition or behavioral health condition, those are conversations that either if the psychiatrist or psychologist is not comfortable talking about that with you to say, oh, do you have a connection with your um, obstetrical or gynecological provider to talk to you about your intentions to become pregnant in the next three months, six months, a year, so that those conversations can ideally be had um, ahead of time. Uh, we will take care of you no matter what and under, under whatever circumstances, but the ideally would be not to deal with the, oops, I'm pregnant, but oh, I plan to become or I intend to become and what can I, um, what, how, how, what conversation, shared decision-making can we have regarding um, my particular medications? I don't, I can't speak to any individual circumstance in this, in this uh, webinar, but just in general, I think those are good um, approaches to kind of have. Yeah, and, it, and it's just making me, again, sort of thinking about the different sort of experiences of, of moms coming to us at the Motherhood Center, you know, and, and one of the things that, you know, that, that we're very proud of is that our psychiatrists as reproductive psychiatrists, this you know, is their particular area. And so a lot of the concerns around, will this affect my baby? Can I do this? Um, you know, I think it, is, it often is really connecting to um, the, the right specialist, right? So sometimes it might not just be a psychiatrist, but sort of looking to maybe connect um, with a reproductive psychiatrist who really has the specific um, knowledge um, and that are very accustomed to then collaborating with um, OBs and, 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 and other um, professionals in this area just made me sort of think of that. Um, I am looking at the time and I, there are some specific questions that I wanted to ask um, uh, you all. Uh, um, and I wanna kind of get to those um, I was wondering, Dr. Claire, if you could talk to us a little bit about um, ACOG District 2 and um, some, some of the work and some of the things that are being done to address um, uh, maternal and mental health outcomes. Sure. Thank you. I, I am representing myself as an individual this evening, but, but ACOG District 2 stands for the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and we have um, District 2 represents about 5,000 OBGYNs throughout New York State. And some of the work that we've done to address maternal mental health issues is uh, collaboration with the New York State Perinatal Quality uh, Collaborative, as well as uh, an organization called Project Teach. Um, and what that organization in doing in collaboration uh, with our, our group is to, um, one, provide more access of psychiatrists to OBGYNs. And so in this telehealth world that we have, um, we know that there are sort of limitations, right, in us getting access to answering those sort of acute 
questions of um, a patient that might be in front of us so that we can have uh, questions to answer that similar to what has come up um, in this panel this evening, um, how to treat a patient with a particular condition or they have a question about medications that they're on and how can that affect them in their pregnancy, as well as just providing information to our members who are OBGYNs just about seeking um, care for their patients. Um, th that is a challenge. There's not that many reproductive psychiatrists that are immediately available mm -hmm. to us. There are some programs, I think Columbia has one where they have psychiatrists that are seeing patients within um, an OBGYN setting. And so the patients are sort of having a one-stop shop. Psychiatrists and psychologists are immediately available to uh, pregnant patients that can see them right at their time of their prenatal visit. Um, and nowadays that with telehealth, that's probably a little bit easier uh, for patients. Um, and especially that they're not gonna be coming in as many times. I think those are some strategies that we've done in order to address um, how we can take care of our patients better in collaboration with our behavioral health colleagues. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to um, ask Dr. Ghazi um, just to speak to us a little bit more about um, pelvic floor physical therapy and um, because again, sort of, you know, finding, you know, one of the reasons many mothers come to us, particularly in the day program, um, sort of a common thing will come up is some sort of traumatic birth experience, right? That, that may require some sort of um, uh, PT treatment. Um, and it, it just, again, and sort of going back to, I think Dr. Bouquet and you had spoken to just a little bit of a lack of knowledge of, of what what those conditions are, what that treatment even is, and sort of wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So pelvic floor physical therapy is just a subfield of orthopedic physical therapy. So um, pelvic floor physical therapists look at you as a, a complete orthopedic lens, in a complete orthopedic lens, um, treating your musculoskeletal system. So that can be regular more standard traditional things that you might think of when you think of a PT. So back pain, sacroiliac joint pain, um, wrist pain or mother's thumb that sometimes people get, you know, traditional neck pain, frozen shoulders, things like that. But the added lens that a pelvic floor physical therapist adds to everything is actually at the pelvis specifically. And uh, pelvic floor PTs are all trained to treat in and around um, the pelvic floor, around bowel, bladder, and sexual function, um, around the genitals, and those muscles, the bones, the ligaments, all of this stuff there is the same as it is everywhere else. It's just at an intimate place where people don't really want to go to, and people don't want to talk about these dysfunctions that happen at the pelvic floor. And so that's prob that's main the main reason why most people are either underdiagnosed completely misdiagnosed or they they just don't even get the diagnosis in the first place which is actually i think the the biggest problem is that it's at an intimate place and it's doing things to their bodies that um they don't really know about how to address so if, for example things i mentioned before are things like urinary and fecal incontinence it affects your quality of life so much number of women that i have um, mothers who will come to me either um, prenatally or postpartum who will tell me, you know, I can't even uh, go down the street to like run to catch the bus without completely leaking my pants. And I wear black, uh, black tights and I wear multiple pads, whether I think I'm going to pee myself or not. Those kinds of things can really affect them, affect their social engagements. Um, you know, the Fecal incontinence, a huge thing that a lot of my patients will um, eventually tell me, you know, a few sessions down the line, they'll say, I'm so embarrassed about the smell. And that's such a hard thing to live with that affects you. It's a huge stress. You know, right now we're all telehealth working from home, but um, prior to this and hopefully in the future, we'll be in a more social place, right? So those kinds of incontinence issues. And then there's the issues with your partner. So pain with intimacy. Um, pain with intercourse, all of these things are within the pelvic floor physical therapy's um, scope of practice um, and often go underlooked. And some people might be hearing these kinds of things for the first time, right? Today, that 
if you have pain with intercourse or intimacy, um, that's actually something that's very treatable if given the right care and given a proper diagnosis and referred to the right practitioners. So I often work with psychology very closely because um, having that intimate relationship with your partner uh, you know, is a big part of a mother's life, especially when there's a baby involved, right? You have a baby and the, there's already a problem getting the space and the time and uh, being with your significant other if, if you have one, or even if you don't to just be with, with other partners. Um, and then there's a, a big, uh, you know, mental health sort of problem there as well. So I often refer to sex therapists. I refer to counseling for people to um, get on the same page with their partner. The partner might be completely unaware of these things. Oftentimes I am the first person without the psychology degree to have to come to the, well, I, I have an undergraduate degree in psychology, but I don't think that goes too far. So I'm usually the first person to sit there and speak to, for example, if we're talking about a heterosexual relationship, speak to the husband and say, hey, you know, these are the things that are going on with your wife right now. Um, she's having an incredible amount of pain with penetration. She doesn't want to talk to you about it because she's really embarrassed. Um, and so these are the things that we're working on. And would you like to be a part of this conversation? And would you like to join us? And would you like me to set you guys up with couples therapy or sex or just a regular psychologist who has the tools to um, reduce the stress levels in the household? You know, you add the pandemic on top of it, you add a newborn on top of it, um, and then you add, you know, intimacy issues on top of it. And it just creates this layer of uh, discomfort and stress that could otherwise be avoided if people firstly just knew that they could seek the help, right? So, I mean, I could go on and on with the various different diagnoses, but there are even um, smaller things that don't even have to deal with a traumatic birth. Uh, the number of women that I have who have a plain old C-section, it was a planned C-section. There, there was nothing complicated about it at all. And usually after their six week checkup, I am the first person who takes their hand and places it on their belly and they will weep. And they'll say, this is the first time I'm getting in touch with my body. I feel disgusted with everything down here. I don't feel myself. I feel very overwhelmed by everything. And me just touching my belly or, uh, you know, touching around my pelvis is a huge step for me connecting with my body. And I think this is where that mental health and physical health really comes together because a lot of the stuff people don't know that they can seek help or they don't even know that there is a problem um, and then the media on top of it adds this another layer of like you know making everything very normalized and um, making everything seem like it's okay or you need to bounce back with your body and a lot of people especially um, people of color who may not you know, necessarily have a whole bunch of model societies, like models out there in their everyday lives will feel very overwhelmed by this whole conversation. And so um, pelvic PTs are really there to help specifically during and around that um, postpartum, per perinatal and postpartum period and across the lifespan too, into the perimenopausal, postmenopausal period when there are another set of hormonal changes and a lot of these issues might recur and come back. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to sort of ask um, Dr. Bouquet a specific question. And this, um, I, I sort of thought about asking this earlier. So, um, and I, I missed that chance. So I want to ask you now to speak a little bit about um, intergenerational trauma, um, sort of what in, in folks that are. Um, uh, with us might sort of know what that term is, but I, I was sort of wondering if you could sort of speak to that a little bit, um, because it is something, again, in, in the work that I do that I see come up and, and part of the treatment is sort of explaining what that is or giving some language to it. So wondering if you could, could speak a little bit, a little bit to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, some of, um what's important to understand about intergenerational trauma is that it, it basically falls under the umbrella of trauma and traumatic experiences. Um, how it applies here really is that, you know, it, it especially um, with a mother, especially um, within a perinatal um, uh, moments in time in a woman's life, uh, it, it becomes so much more evident that this is um, an area that that has uh, a specific impact upon a, a mother and a child, and um, really the the 
important thing to know about intergenerational trauma is that there are two avenues of transmission. So, and, and whoever, you know, on the panel, you know, has, has some added knowledge to this, please add on. I, I, um, I welcome that, but there, the, the first uh, mode of transmission is an epigenetic marker transmission by which um, a mother that has been a person that has been in, in trauma, specifically if, if the mother has been uh, having the experience of chronic trauma or chronic PTSD or CPTSD as we call it, um, that that a person has um, genetic markers that have um, uh, been framed around the trauma because of the ways that the body uh, internalizes stress hormonally um, and that in utero, uh, these genetic markers can be um, transitioned on to the fetus and, and then, you know, to the, to the, um, to the child. And then the other side of that is when BIPOC mothers are relegated to automatically, right, um, the experiences of social markers of uh, trauma, uh, which, you know, discrimination can be one of them and there are a host of others. And when the trauma is experienced in one's life, um, uh, when the, the trauma is experienced even in the child's life and, and in the then adult's life that um, there is this, this other social um, experience around trauma that then creates this uh, transgenerational uh, transmission of trauma. So there is a biological component and then there is a social component and together the two really um, are married in, in creating the, the, the intergenerational transmission of trauma that that we tend to see tends to happen in the lineage of people that um, are from Black and Indigenous um, uh, communities, uh, especially because chronic stress and uh, chronic trauma tends to be a, a big marker of our lived experiences. Thank so, you. Go ahead. But, yeah, that's the gist of it. Um, <laughs> you know, it can be expanded like to no ends, right? Because there's so many ways in which it shows up, but yeah. I mean, I think I would see that that transmitted in, in my work in terms of people's experiences with, with breastfeeding and chest feeding, um, as well as, you know, whether they feel comfortable in doing that or, or, or not because of that sort of experience of trauma. And then there has been some studies looking at weathering and whether that's been manifested, these chronic stressors and some of the, the poor um, obstetrical outcomes that, that patients may experience, such as preterm birth and preterm labor. So, so I think it's very much connected to what we're seeing um, in the work that I do as well. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I mean, like it, it really kind of like starts unpacking, you know, the ways that we can look at intergenerational trauma. Like even if you look at mothers that, you know, um, by way of how they're, um, you know, the, the, their economic situation, right, are relegated to food deserts and that that in and of itself is a way and poverty is trauma, that plain and simply, right, you know, and being a person that, you know, has to exist in a food desert and then that that is the, the point of nutrition by which you have to actually um, feed, you know, your child in utero, that that in and of itself is one element of trauma that can actually be transmitted within. And then, you know, that that just follows through um, through the person's lifespan, the, the child then a than adults, you know, and so it, it, it becomes like this whole entire process um, by which trauma is just kind of a marker at each stage in life. I do have one more question, but before I ask it, I, I want to just invite um, folks in attendance, if you have specific questions after this one question I have, I wanted to, to shift gears and sort of open it up, open it up for Q&A. So if people do have specific questions for the whole panel or for anyone, um, any specific person to speak to something, please put that in the chat and we'll be moving on, on to that portion um, in just a few moments. I, I did want to ask Dr. Johnson um, for um, your thoughts on what can we um, you know, I, I guess, what can we do as providers to better support Black women through their journey, um, through their motherhood journey? Um, and also sort of wonder, you know, sort of like on the provider side, how do we do that? Um, but also wondering if you have any thoughts on, um, you know, 
sort of, you know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking, you know, how, how to sort of empower our, and support some autonomy for within Black women and, and other um, um, women of color, you know, through their journey, what, 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 what can be helpful? And I'm even thinking before, so I'm, you know, I'm even thinking maybe even like before pregnancy, right? Like if it is a planned pregnancy, sort of thinking of the journey in that way. Um, one of the one of the first things that comes to mind when you when you bring this up is this these sort of expectations, some of them which are sort of culturally um, embedded around the strength of Black women um, and the strength of other BIPOC women, right? And so there's a lot of times there's an expectation uh, that BIPOC women sort of remain strong, right? Um, and, and, and that manifests in a number of different ways. One of the most obvious ways, right, is that there's sort of a, um, uh, an abandonment of one's own needs, right? To, to take care of the needs of the, you know, the partner, the other children, siblings, parents, you know, a whole host of individuals. Um, and so one of the things, you know, about empowerment is that we recognize that like strong is not necessarily a, an adjective that any of us would sort of like balk at if someone called us strong, right? And at the same time, um, for BIPOC women, specifically Black women, it's, it's such a pervasive and problematic label um, in that even for Black women to be called strong, some of, some of them might, you know, sort of respond to that with you know like flatter like that feels flattering right like oh i am very strong right but one of the ways that providers can um can help black women and other bipoc women um is is by helping them to recognize that strength sometimes can go a bit too far right um and that like taking care of one's own needs is also a strength right being able to uh recognize when you're experiencing pain being able to recognize when you um your mood has changed right or you're experiencing symptoms being in tune with yourself is actually a strength. Um, and so sort of it, the idea is shifting the notion of strength into a way and into something that serves the mom or the woman, right? And instead of sort of um, doing these culturally embedded things where we have the strong black woman archetype, right? Or we have, you know, Marianismo, right? Where there's sort of the selflessness and the, I'm gonna take care of everyone else. And that is part of my identity, separating that aspect of identity um, that can be sort of reinforced for BIPOC women and, and allowing them to um, explore a different way of being that also honors their own needs uh, can be really, really powerful. And I do this quite a bit in my work where I say, well, you know, who is taking care of you? And also, how are you asking for the things that you need um, and empowering them to do so in ways that feel maybe a little uncomfortable at times, right? Even for themselves, like, I don't really want to ask for help, or I think I can do this by myself. Why should you, right? In what, in what universe do we all have to do everything ourselves, right? That's not fair. And also providing, I think, you know, uh, Dr. Bouquet said this, like, providing information about the history of this, right? Like, there, there is a history around how come you feel like you have to do everything yourself. And I'm here to let you know that that's actually not serving you, right? That may not be serving you in all situations. So I think a lot of the empowerment comes from like really shifting some of the ways in which, you know, stereotypes and culturally embedded practices have harmed BIPOC women um, and allowing them to think of themselves as strong um, in a different way. Thank you. Dr. Clark, do you have something to add? No, I, I, I oh, didn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I was just listening. I, I appreciated okay. our comments. Uh, thank you. Okay, just want to make sure. It's hard on Zoom. It sort of feels like <laughs> you have to like check in. Um, um, but um, I did want to, so there are some questions coming in um, through the chat. Um, and so one question, um, it seems it's come up a couple times, and this is directed to um, Dr. Bouquet, um, is to, what's your perspective on herbal remedies? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I believe in 
holistic wellness and indigenous practices, and especially the practices that have been there before westernized medicine, you know, um, was relegated to being like, you know, the, the dominant um, ideology around healing. Um, uh, and so I, I believe in being able to honor indigenous practices and bringing in indigenous healers and, and perspectives um, into the work that we do from a westernized perspective, because all of us are kind of, you know, operating from that western world of medicine. Um, and, you know, and it is also important to, to uh, bring in that perspective in, an, in a multidisciplinary way, right? Um, I, I, almost every herb that you can imagine or supplement that is out there um, usually has some sort of a caveat around like if you're pregnant you know consult with your physician about taking such and such right um, and so there is a reason why you know some of the, those disclaimers are there um, and, and that's why it's important to have some of the conversations around whichever herbs or um, indigenous remedies you're thinking about um, with your physician so that there can be a, a collaboration around your care uh, between um, whatever um, you know, uh, indigenous practices you're, you're assuming and, and the ones that um, you're engaging in um, with your physician. So I would say just having an open dialogue about um, what the, the pros and cons are of being able to engage in um, herbal use is, is incredibly important. It, that, that includes everything, you know, teas and, um, you know, supplements or uh, whatever else is out there that is a part of what historically has been indigenous practices that have been helpful and healing to our people for, for as long as we've been alive um, are important to honor. And at the same time, you know, we want to make sure that um, your journey is safe and, and uh, having open dialogue is, is really one of the best ways that you can ensure that. Thank you. Um, so we have a question for Dr. Claire. Um, wondering about providing trauma-informed OB care for BIPOC women. Yeah, thank you for that question. I would say um, a lot of the information, um, even educating providers, um, has come from training from the New York City Department of Health, Department of um, Department of Health and Mental Health, Mental Hygiene, um, to educate providers on what trauma informed uh, care is. So I think um, this is. I would say in the last year or two, um, what that is and educating providers about what that is um, has been uh, more and more available to us, um, especially those of us who work in New York City in particular and New York State. So I think um, more and more providers are aware of what that is and how to um, think of patients and take care of patients from that trauma-informed lens. Um, even as simple as as um, examinations um, and what type of examinations um, people are going to have during the during pregnancy, during the birthing process, process and experience, during gynecological care as well as obstetrical care. So um, I think for many of us, um, we are familiar with that. And 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 if you're going to a provider who's not familiar with that, um, really asking that question, are you familiar with that? Do you know what that is and how can that impact the care that you're going to give me? Those are um, important questions when we talk about patient um, empowerment and advocating for themselves. Um, that's a very good question to have, you know, right from the beginning. Thank you. Um, another question, are there recommendations for what we can do as providers to support women of color specifically and signal that it's a space where they are welcome? So that, that would be open to, to, to anyone on the panel. Can you repeat that question? Yeah. I don't think quite exactly what they were getting yeah. to. Are there recommendations for what we can do as providers to support women of color specifically and signal that it's a, a safe space where they're welcome? So I guess where the, that the provider space is safe and welcome to women of color. So what, 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 can, be, what can providers do to signal safety for women of color and their practices? 
Um, I'll just say one, one thing that I think that people can do um, from a provider perspective is um, other than what we've repeated a lot, which is staying educated and understanding cultural competency is actually offering things specifically for that community and various communities as well. And I think that calling out for um, people to join the conversation and ask questions, reaching out to different groups in different places. I guess this is what I'm thinking that we're doing in um, my nonprofit organization is outside of people reaching out to us, we actually do more of the reach out to say, hey, we have this to offer. Um, going to you know uh, schools, um, inner city schools and saying, we're gonna offer this health education so that you, know, you can take that with you and um, you know, spread that knowledge. I think uh, creating specific offerings is one really good way to make very tangible moves in the right direction and making um, different communities feel welcome in the conversation as well. What, what I would add is that just th that continued community engagement piece in the in the areas of where we're serving and taking care of patients so that you know already having that connection with the, with the community members to let them know that this particular organization, this particular institution is interested in the in the uh, perspective of the community. Um, for example, very often hospitals have community, um, community uh, advocates or community advisory boards in which that community member actually sits and provides their perspective um, and has a, a, an active role in the table of, of things that are going on in that particular institution if that's the framework or the setting in which you're working. So I think community engagement is, um, is, a, is a piece that's an ongoing process and just allowing for that ongoing process I think um, is just critical to be able to, to develop that trust that we spoke about um, in the beginning uh, with our patients. And uh, I will always use the term patients, but clients, I recognize clients as well. So I, I think that's, that's really critical. Thank you. I think a lot of the work for us clinicians really starts at home, right? You know, being able to look within ourselves at the ways in which we are operating from, you know, um, Eurocentric ideologies or harmful ideologies that um, don't honor or affirm the experiences of BIPOC individuals is really essential. Um, and being able to um, also, um, you know, continuously on a daily basis, ask ourselves the question, you know, how can I decolonize my practice? How can I decolonize the space, you know, and how can I have this space be reflective of the people that I'm serving in all of the ways, right? Down to, um, you know, the ways that I'm interacting with them in the hallway, right? Before we even get into session. And, you know, even in the ways that um, my space is reflected, like does, does it embody um, the spirit of the people that I'm serving? And I'll just say, uh, you know, among all the other things that have been suggested, um, I would also add that opening up a conversation, inviting people to have a conversation about their identity. Um, so broaching that in the first therapeutic interaction and saying like, you know, like, how do you identify? Like, you know, what are your pronouns? Like, so digging and sort of assessing that information can be really powerful with regard to how comfortable someone feels when they say, well, in, you know, inviting them to have that conversation lets them know as the clinician, you care about aspects of identity in, with regard to how you're treating them, right? And so that might mean like, you know, I, you know, I practice from this perspective, right? Meaning that I practice from a holistic perspective where I want to understand um, all of the ways that, you know, I can treat you, right? But also may miss things because of our differences in identity, right? Or some of our similarities. Um, with that invitation, maybe, you know, there's nothing that comes from that initial, <laughs> that initial uh, invitation, right? But later down the road, what you find is that the patient or the clients says things like, well, in my culture, we actually think about it in this way, right? Or like, uh, for people like us, we don't really do that. Or we don't really talk about that with people outside the household, right? And so you realize that by broaching that subject early on, even if it goes nowhere in the first conversation, it uh, creates safety and creates a comfortability around talking about issues of race. Um, gender, uh, culture, right, ethnicity. Um, and so the, the provider doing that is incredible 
incredibly impactful. We also know, and I, doc, Dr. Claire, Dr. Ghazi, Dr. Bouquet, we all know, right, that there are huge dropout rates for BIPOC people and specifically BIPOC uh, women as well. And so um, in order to sort of decrease dropout from treatment and whatever modality of treatment that is, you want to be able to broach issues of identity um, so that people feel comfortable if that is important to them to continue to talk with you about it as their provider. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, I am a biracial mom struggling with biracial twins that don't look like me and people think I am the nanny. I'm having difficulty connecting with my babies and feel like my pregnancy wasn't real. How can I reconcile these feelings when I don't have providers that look like me? Thank you for sharing that that experience. I I I I think that that that's a lot to unpack in this evening. But I I would say that that I I I would suggest that um, seeking providers that you feel like have your your sense of lived experience is important. If you're able to find that, um, there are many there are many organizations in which to find um, particular providers that may have your you know, that may speak to your needs um, is one, but I, I think that that does require kind of a longer conversation and, and probably a lot that can be um, can be broached through the motherhood center, I would imagine. Um, so so I don't know if other other um, panelists would have anything else to add to that. I think the only other thing to add could be that don't be afraid to ask the questions. Um, I know this is a lot, like Dr. Claire said, it's a lot to unpack in, the, in this evening, but um, you know, even with the previous question about the trauma-informed care, uh, of, uh, trauma -informed care and asking your provider, um, do you have experience with this? I think that's also applies here where you can go to a provider and ask those questions and say, um, you know, hey, do you have experience working with this particular situation? Is this something that you have treated before? Um, I get questions like that all the time. and. Um, you know, I think as a practitioner, I welcome that question. And I now know that we've just kind of taken our relationship further one step and we can break down a barrier that we'd never have to think about ever again, because we know that we're on the same page now. And so being forthcoming with your questions, um, I think could be one additional thing that you could do in seeking care. Among everything else, I just want to share that that's not uh, that's not rare, right? Um, that you know issues of race, phenotype from you know mom to child come up quite often. And I think that the Motherhood Center actually has experienced this um, from uh, individuals who are involved with the Motherhood Center. And so um, I think you're not alone in your experience. And I also think you know we could. We don't have time and I think the space to really appropriately address your question, but I think it's a it's an, an important one. I think you are not alone and I do think that there are providers out there who can really help you navigate this in a in a really careful um, and, and um, empathic way because it is it, it's not something that only you are experiencing. Yeah, if I if I could jump in, you know, I, I think um, <laughs> you know, sort of think just thinking about time and sort of not really totally being able to unpack this whole thing, but this, this does come up. And so, um, and, you know, I, I think in my experience at the motherhood center, um, it comes up and oftentimes it, it comes up after I do some inquiry around it and sort of asking questions. And, you know, so I think from my perspective, being being quite direct and asking you know this is my experience are you know are you comfortable with this right and, and sort of asking those specific things i think um it is, is the best way to go Be because quite frankly someone might look um like you but i think some of the specifics of your experience you you, you can't quite assume that that person is prepared to, to help work through that with you. So I, I think, you know, there's something really powerful and just, you know, this is, this is what I'm coming in with. Is this something 
um, that you're familiar with? Are you comfortable with this? You know, and, and, and sort of take it from there and sort of make the decision whether um, this is someone that you can work with on this. But th this, there are, are many others, um, moms with the same experience. So it's certainly not, you're, you're not alone. Um, There is another question, um, and I'm thinking this will be specifically for Dr. Um, Ghazi, or certainly I want to direct it to you first. Um, and this kind of came up a little bit, but maybe speaking a little bit more about um, pain threshold, uh, how doctors have a pain threshold for BIPOC women using less medication anesthesia anesthesia, uh, meaning that doctors think BIPOC women have a higher threshold of pain and often use less of those interventions. Um, so wondering if you could speak, speak to that a, a bit. Yeah, and I, I believe the question is asking in the sense of providers and doctors having this uh, misconception. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess the, the bottom line is that if you are really in medicine uh, and you know the literature and you know the research, the provider should know that such a thing does not exist. And such a thing is very misinformed and comes from a place of extreme inequity and biases and uh, a bad space and that we still live in, unfortunately. Um, so if you do, I guess, I guess I'll answer it from this perspective. If you're a provider and you believe such a thing, then I think that that provider really needs to take a look at their own biases, take a look at the literature and surround themselves with people who have a bit more of a, a equality perspective when it comes to treating and patient care. If you're a patient though, who experiences something like that um, and has a, a doctor who um, expresses this bias to you, I think that's something that definitely needs to be taken to taken to a higher level and uh, the per that doctors um, and this is this is my personal perspective I don't know how other panelists feel about that but I, I just think that such a belief would be unacceptable and that 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 doctor really does need to or that provider needs to um, really get some education around that and um, you know really work on their biases and work on the the literature because as a doctor usually people have to um, you know are more inclined to take a look at research and evidence-based uh, care. So I think that, um, yeah, I just don't, I don't know if that, that there should be a place in that. And unfortunately I know that there is, um, but it shouldn't be acceptable. And I think whoever comes across it should definitely address it because it needs to, it needs to be uh, not a part of that conversation anymore. And you should definitely seek another provider. Thank you. Um... So that's our last question. Um, so to move to um, wrap things up, I just want to say um, a huge thank you to all of our um, panelists. Um, just thank you for all of the wisdom and knowledge um, that you shared with us here today. I, I feel very lucky that I was able to uh, spend um, an hour or so with you all. Um, and really hoping that everyone was able to um, take some something um, helpful and informative away from tonight's discussion. Um, this has been recorded. So after um, we end our discussion tonight, this recording will be made available to everyone who registered. Um, so you can look out for that and that will come out um, to you with some additional resources. Um, and the other sort of last reminder that I wanted to um, share with everyone is that if you or someone you know um, who is a uh, black or um, other woman of color looking for community support to connect to other BIPOC mothers uh, at the Motherhood Center, we have our Mothers of Color support group um, that runs on Mondays from four to 5 p.m. Um, so please come and, and check us out. Attending this will give you 15% off. Um, and certainly, you know, the space is there um, for community and just to kind of connect to other moms. Um, um, 
yeah, and, and to be helpful in that way. Um, so, um, so I think that's it. So thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, and, and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you too. so much for having us. Thanks, thank you, Roshni. Thank you. Thank you.